Welcome back to WCHS, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be talking about A2 again here today. And uh, just to remind you, we do have an A2 exam next week. And to that end, I thought it might be prudent to go through the steps one more time. So the first thing I'd always recommend that you do is take a look at what's on the page. Now, I have uh, brought back up the old economic sources from the old diploma exams for you. And I think you can see a pattern. So you do have an archive of all the old sources. And I just copied the sources out of the, that archive. And you can see a pattern. And the pattern is that the sources are typically presented to you as including a problem and a solution. The path to economic growth is not engineered by the government. Rather, the path to economic prosperity is built by the people. So what is the problem? Economic engineering through the government. What is the solution? Through the people instead. Sometimes the problem solution is explicit. Sometimes it's more implicit. An economic system based on private property turns citizens against each other. The interests of those who have are in conflict with the interests of those who have not. So there the uh, problem is explicit that uh, you, know, you have you know, the haves and have-nots in conflict with each other. There is no stated solution, explicitly stated. But we can imply that if it's a statement against private property, then the solution is to embrace public property. So sometimes the solution is explicit, sometimes it's implicit. But what we see here is a pattern of problem-solution. Society achieves its finest expression through self-interest and freedom of individuals. When we adopt those principles, these principles, we will lessen the need for government to interfere in our lives. Problem? The government's interfering in our lives. The solution, we need to uh, adopt the principles of self-interest and freedom. So one way to break down sources is to look within it and say, is this source communicating about a problem within society? And if so, is there an explicit solution or an implicit solution stated there? But each one of these sources, representing about half of the diploma essays that we've seen so far, basically keeps asking the same question. What kind of economic system should we have? So you need to be ready to write an essay next week in class about an economic system. We don't know the exact language of the source, but all these sources using different language are getting to the same theme. And what is the ideal economic system? So when we get to breaking down the sources, unpacking what's on the page, I would say first identify the theme. So in June, you might have multiple themes to pick from. You know, is it a political source? Is it an economic source? Next week, it is an economic source. So you should be able to already have the idea of what the theme is going into the exam. So the theme of the source will be some kind of statement about our economic relationship between government and the people. Might have a related concept about the nature of mankind. If this, then what? But that's definitely the theme that you'll be seeing next week. Then it's going to be critical to identify key terms. And this is still a step that some of the essays that I have marked so far that were due yesterday, this is still a step that we can improve upon. What is the significance of language? Breaking down the significance of the language is a key step to the analyzing the source. So although it is never explicitly stated what economic growth refers to, who defines it is very significant. During the 1930s, Stalin defined economic growth as rapid industrialization and was willing to trade the lives of millions of kulaks to achieve it. Additionally, many capitalists have been criticized for promoting economic growth measured in terms of GDP and per capita income ahead of environmental realities or you know, citizen happiness. So this is taking the word economic growth from that source and saying, you know what, let's unpack that word a little bit. That's a key term. These are key terms that I'm going to make sure that somewhere in my analysis, I want to make sure that I show that I understand what these ideas mean. That's what analyzing the source means, is breaking down the language. So this is an example of breaking down the language. Then we can look at the source and say, what is the goal of this source? The path to economic growth is not engineered by the government, rather the path to economic prosperity is built by the people. Well, the goal here is growth and prosperity. Now, what is the significance of the, actually this part, 
be after the next part. Identify the problem and then identify the significance of overcoming the problem. So identify the problem in the way of achieving the goal. By stating the path to economic growth is not engineered by the government, the source also presents a problem that could prevent us from achieving growth and prosperity. Specifically, the problem is that economic engineering, government economic engineering is flawed. And then, what is the significance of overcoming this flaw? If left unaddressed, we can infer that without identifying the proper path, we'll not achieve growth and prosperity. So who cares about growth and prosperity? A society without growth tends to decay. Individuals without prosperity tend to grow desperate. As this desperation grows, revolutions can become common. One has a vested interest in maintaining this order, the current order, is critical to overcome or uncover, sorry, the best economic path that allows growth and prosperity. So these kinds of statements, you can have pre-planned going into the exam and pre-planned going into the diploma. Knowing that there's a, you know, 100% chance next week's exam is about economics and a 50% chance that in June it's going to be an economic essay, then we can pre-plan these things. Offer some evidence to continue the perspective. So we know that the significance or the problem is uh, economic engineering. Well, the observation that economic engineering has come in the way of prosperity could be based upon the 20th century experiments with command economics, Maoism, Stalinism, um, and the resulting tragedies. Identify the solution. Within this source, the ideological perspective of the source is therefore a rejection of centrally planned economies, command economies, practiced by economic collectivists. Therefore, the solution is economic individualism. And then associate that solution with liberalism, being that the source is reacting to economic collectivism. This would be not Adam Smith, because he's not reacting to collectivism. This would be a desire to go back to Smith. This is neoclassical liberalism. So we're trying to associate the perspective with the main ideology of the course, liberalism. Is it in favor of liberalism? Is it challenging liberalism? Is it looking to replace liberalism? We want to make that connection. We want to associate it with related values and beliefs and world visions. This is where you can talk about the role of government, the role of citizens. This is where we would take the term, the path to economic prosperity is built by the people, and connect that to the concept of the invisible hand. Maybe throw in a quote from Adam Smith there about, you know, it's not from the benevolence of the brewer, that quote. Identify possible limitations or assumptions within the perspective. So not everybody agrees with the solution presented, that there are some assumptions made by the, by the source, and because these assumptions may be, may be uh, false, then we may have some opponents against the source. The source is based on some rather significant assumptions, including the idea that capitalism will create broad-based prosperity and not create cruel disparity. Opponents of the source would echo Karl Marx, who observed a class struggle that resulted from capitalism. Contemporary critics of capitalism would divide the world into two groups, the 1% that capitalism benefits and the 99% that capitalism manipulates. And then we have our thesis. So you'll never be able to write an essay in class if you don't have a plan. Even if I give you two, two days next week, even if I give you two 75 minute periods, you'll be like, yeah, I still need more time. And I'll be like, I'm sorry, the, the exam's over. You need to have a plan going in. And part of that plan is to identify the recurring patterns in these sources. That the sources typically present a problem and either explicitly or implicitly there's a solution there as well. We should be able to take those problems and solutions, connect them to the theme of the course. We also have to identify the key terms on the page. This is something that's unique to whatever language I use on the source next week. We want to identify the goal, the problem, the significance of overcoming the problem, offer some evidence to continue the perspective. This is where students get in a trap and they give me two pages of evidence in the analysis to continue the perspective. You're drifting off topic. You can see how little evidence I offered. Just a quick reference to it is all we need. You don't need to unpack that case study, just a quick reference to, you know, the voice behind the source would refer to, you know, the Great Leap Forward under Mao and the resulting famine as proof that economic engineering is flawed. If you want to go into more detail about that, 
use it in your body. Identify the solution, associate the solution with liberalism, connect it to beliefs and values, and identify possible limitations. I would suggest to you that you should be able to do all of those steps for all of these sources that we've already used. And what you're going to see next week on the exam is a source that's going to look a lot like these sources, some kind of combination of them. So that's my first thoughts about A2 today, is your analysis of source part. And although we're moving in the right direction, we want to make sure that we clean up the process a little bit. I have some students that are basically meandering their way through it, and, and they're taking too much time through, the, through this step. Or I have some other students that are missing some of the steps. The second thing that I've noticed on these essays this week is that there's just simply not enough argumentation. That your essays are still, here's a report, this is all I know about this case study, this is all I know about another case study, and you kind of figure out why it's important to continue my thesis. To have argumentation drive your essay comes down to having a, a clear thesis statement that allows you to talk about everything you want to talk about. Although capitalism can create prosperity, it also creates challenges. At the same time, central planned economics can be purposeful, but they too are riddled with challenges. Therefore, we need a mix. So if that was my, my thesis statement, my first body paragraph would be capitalism can create prosperity. My second body paragraph, capitalism creates challenges. A third body paragraph, centrally planned economics can be, you know, at times purposeful. A fourth one, they're riddled with challenges. Fifth one, we need a mix. We need to make sure that our topic sentences are statements of argument, not an introduction to evidence. That your topic sentence should be a statement, that therefore you prove. Each body paragraph is like a mini essay. And your topic sentence is, is like a mini thesis statement. That's the purpose of your paragraph. If your topic sentences are not arguments but evidence, I am not giving you an E for argumentation because you have misplaced focus in your body. Lead your body paragraphs with statements of arguments. If you're struggling with organizing arguments and you feel like you keep just saying the same thing, one of the easiest things for you to do would be to go back, look at all these sources, because what they are are statements of arguments, and categorize them. Here you are, here's a list of statements in favor of capitalism. These are statements I can use in a paragraph about why capitalism works. Now I have more argumentation. You need to collect arguments as you go through the course. Go through these sources, go through the essays I've provided as examples, and create an archive of all these arguments in favor of capitalism. And then create one, all these arguments against capitalism. And then create a third one, arguments in favor of collectivism. And a fourth one, arguments against collectivism. Because argumentation is still a weakness in our essays. We're writing a lot of evidence, and I'm somewhat forgiving about that, but as we get closer to June, I have to become less forgiving. I need to see more argumentation. So how do you get more argumentation in your essay? You need to collect more argumentation so that you have arguments at your writing. So that's something I would re definitely recommend that you work on. The last thing I'll mention, um, and then I'll upload this to YouTube, is that sometimes some things are more purposeful than others. It might fit, but it might not be the best tool. Hobbes might fit, but Marx might be better because it's an economic paper. You know, it's, it, it might be fitting if you're talking about you know, economic engineering doesn't work in Canada when the government tries to run liquor stores. You know, that might fit. Maoism might be more convincing. So there's, there's stronger tools. There's more deliberate evidence more precise evidence, more mature and sophisticated evidence. So what you need to do as well is understand that even though you might have a piece of evidence that can further an argument, is it the best evidence? Is it the most compelling evidence? And that's another hurdle to get over. So I'm going to stop looking at this and I would say 
what you need to do is build those inventories. Arguments in favor of capitalism, arguments against it, arguments in favor of collectivism, arguments against it. And you need to do the same thing politically. Arguments in favor of democracy, against democracy, in favor of dictatorships, against dictatorships. If you don't do this, when you're trying to build an essay around argumentation, you're probably going to be kind of general. That's an S. That's a 60. So do try to collect more arguments. All right, I'm going to stop recording.